Ja extrem ljubo stajali, ker... Yeah, I think. Are we on here? There you go, there you go. Well, while Ranjeni gets, well, she gets fixed up. Okay. Yeah. Go, go, go. It went well. It was uh, these like are SACP uh, couches, not EFF yeah. couches, by go, go, the way. Go, 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 go. Um, just to be clear on that. Are we on? How's everybody doing, by the way? I really love being felt up on stage. That's different. <laughs> So I was really worried about Richard, you know, because um, they, we had um, a security sweep this morning. We had dogs here, and I thought they may think you're the real transporter. Yeah, okay. tr transport. Well, uh, actually, the prostate exam was a bit rough, <laughs> but uh, I got through it with a smile on my face, and I think that's just how we have to, <laughs> you know. Th this is the new South Africa. I mean, ISIS is here. You know, I've actually been hanging out in malls. With my phone. This is journalists for you. We're vampires. I've been hanging out in malls waiting for something <laughs> to happen. Um, nothing yet. <laughs> well, on that high note, um, our next speaker is light. the Commander in Chief of the Economic Freedom Fighters. This is the first local government election that the Economic Freedom Fighters is competing in, and therefore there's a lot of interest in what they have to say and what's in their manifesto. But actually, there's one thing that I really, really want to know, and that's uh, the CIC's fitness regime. You will notice a smaller package than the one that was here last year. Mm -hmm. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Commander-in-Chief of the Economic Freedom Fighters, the Lina Mina Julius Malema. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, moderators and uh, the leaders of the EFF. I've seen the EFF deputy president, the incoming mayor of Johannesburg, I joke. <laughs> and uh, I've seen the provincial chair and the leadership of Houting. Um, this program took us away from the real program of elections where we're speaking to our people about the importance of bringing about change. But we thought we have an obligation as well to speak to different constituency which you will ordinarily not meet in the rallies and only get to see here where people pay for chess to come and listen to politicians speak. So for me, it's a different constituency altogether and then it's, a, it's an opportunity to really hear from the other side. And I was asking Ranjani if uh, you're going to be given an opportunity to ask questions because I would want to sit in a meeting where one day you are given opportunity to ask us questions and we respond to you because uh, sometimes we do not understand where you come from because the way I come from, our problems are not the same as you. But I'm happy that uh, you had this event a few days before the commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the June 16. A June 16 where young people engage in a rejection of apartheid and white domination. And they said they don't want to be taught in Africans. And the demand for them not to be taught in Africans was not just a rejection of Africans, but was a rejection of white dominance and a rejection of privilege that comes with being an Africaner. And uh, we have seen the re-emergence of the same demand in the University of Pretoria, in the University of Free State, in many universities where many young people have said we are tired of Africans being given a privilege over other languages. And it is not something new because the teaching of Africans is actually creating an impression amongst white people that they are the special ones and therefore they are not people like all of us. And uh, we think that uh, the continuation of this struggle is very important because it seeks to create equality in our society. We have a responsibility to ensure that we fight for an equal society. But we cannot be an equal society if others are given preference over us. 
and how are they given preference? Their language is preferred over our language. And when we say Africans must fall, it doesn't mean Africans must not be spoken. It means Africans should not be given preference and should not be a language of privilege and power. It must be equal to all the languages in South Africa. That's what 1976 demanded. And all of a sudden you want to embrace 1976 and do not want to embrace the demand for the Africans to fall in the institutions of higher learning. That is being a hypocrite because what the students are asking now is the same thing they asked before. The same thing with roads must fall, the same thing with the changing of street names and all that. What is this struggle about? The struggle is to do away with a, a, a white privilege and white dominance in our society. We will never do away with white privilege and dominance if we do not confront it. And if we do not conscientize society that naming places after people who presided over black genocide and promoted apartheid will actually make white people think they are more superior than us. And we don't want that. So I came here not to please anyone. I'm here to speak the truth, whether you like it or not. It's your own baby to feed Malta Bella. I'm not in the business of going around to please people. I only tell the truth. Now, I, am, I, I represent a non-racial organization, but we do not fight for white people. Why? Why should we fight for them? What do you want? What do they want? When you say you are fighting for all in South Africa, black and white, what do white people want? Except to want to remain in a position of privilege. That's what they want. They want to remain in a position of privilege, and we are rejecting that. There is no white person who's going to remain in a position of privilege. We must all be equal. And in bringing the equality, we have to take deliberate decisions to empower the less privileged to be at the same level with those who are privileged. And that's what the EFF manifesto speaks about. Why should we build bicycle lanes? For what? <laughs> White people demand bicycle lanes even when there is no cycling culture in South Africa because they just want something to be done in their areas. Why? Because we are the ones who are paying the high taxes and rates. So something must be done here. You just want things to happen in your areas because you are paying, but there is a huge constituency of people without water and electricity. You must be ashamed that you want bicycle lanes when there are people without flushing toilets. That's what your, that's what your so-called principal came here to tell you before me. And, and he speak everything nice. We are here to crush white dominance. We are here to create an equal society. And crushing of white dominance does not mean hatred of white people. It means the deliberate effort to liberate the black African majority, which is oppressed, and that is not division. Division is when you protect white privilege to the exclusion of black majority. And no one, not Musi, not Zueli, represent that agenda. None of them is committed to stand before you and tell you that we want to bring to black people to the same level with you. We are in a show to watch a music festival. And we are sitting at the back there. I'm with a fellow who is short. And this fellow can't see the artist who's performing there. And then when they bring a chair for this fellow to be at the same level with me to see the artist who's performing there, I have, now I complain. No, we're being treated differently. Why is this one having a chair and I do not have a chair? We are equal. Hey, we're not equal. He can see, you can see. You have to see all of you. There is nothing for free for everybody. Musi must learn to read and stop pretending to be a reader. He must read the EFF manifesto if he cares to do so. There is nothing free for everybody. There is free for the poor. I earn my salary 
is almost more than a million. They wrote about it in the papers yesterday. My grandmother has got no income at all. But she buys, if a liter of water is one rand, she's going to pay one rand, and I'm going to pay one rand for the liter of water. What type of equality is that? When she's got no income at all, here is a parliamentarian who pays one rand, the same amount of money with the person who has got no income. And when I say for those who do not have income, there must be a special price for them. No, he wants free everything for everybody. It is unfair. It is actually undermining the agenda to fight for equality. We need to empower the poor masses of our people. And the rich and the privileged ones should be at the forefront of subsidizing the poor working with government. What is the agenda here? You want water, they want water. You can afford to pay for water, they cannot afford to pay water. And we're saying, let them get water for free. Why should you complain? Because you are also getting water. The only difference is that you can afford for it. Let us give our people water. Our people live in houses in the urban areas with taps which can't produce water because the municipalities have closed. There is no difference between pick and pay and the municipality. When you go to pick and pay, you pay to get water. When you go to a municipality, you pay to get water. Municipalities must not be run like business entities. They must know their first mandate is to deliver services to our people. They must not think their first mandate is to collect money from the people. Give the people water and make those who can afford to pay, pay. And then create methods to raise money. Politicians must start thinking and stop sitting on their brains. How do we generate money without exploiting the poor? How do we create money? We need to have municipalities which are engaged in creativity so that they raise money to subsidize the poor. The poor are actually more poorer today. Why do we have a situation where people don't have flushing toilets? These houses that Zulim Kize is talking about, they've given people RDP houses. After 1994, you give people RDP houses without a flushing toilet. And then you want to say you are bringing dignity of people back without a flushing toilet. There's no dignity without a flushing toilet. You can't claim to have dignity without a flushing toilet. There is no dignity which has been restored through giving people houses which are not in good condition first, but secondly, those houses do not have flushing toilets. If you go even in the most rural areas, you find a farm. In that farm, there is a, a farmhouse of a white man. That white man is not helping himself in a pit toilet. He's got a flushing toilet. Next to that farm, there is a village. That village, the whole village, they use pit toilets. Why is the ANC not going into the white man's farm to see how the white man is flushing and take the same method of the white man and give to black communities next to that farm? I'm just saying because they are lazy thinkers. Maybe if they go to a white man's farm, they will see it practically and start doing it. They can't think of how do we give our people flushing toilets. I had a farm myself which was taken away from me by the ANC and given to a white man again. <laughs> now, next to that farm, there was a village without flushing toilets, but that farm had a flushing toilet. There was electricity, that's the most painful thing. Electricity in all these farms. And as you follow the poles, which are providing electricity in the white farms, they pass the village without electricity. Where is the explanation for that? You give the farmers electricity, you don't give our people electricity, yet the poles are passing there. And, and I support this thing of illegal connection of electricity because 
Those people, those people are actually demonstrating to government practically that you are fools, this thing is doable. We have just done it ourselves. We have just done it ourselves. So that thing exposes the government of the ANC that it is not true that it is practically impossible to deliver electricity to us. We are doing it. And therefore, government must feel ashamed and move in to give our people a safe electricity after being exposed by our people. Mr. Malema, they, you have a minute. They come here and talk about the land. And they ask Musi, what is your land policy? He waffles here and you clap hands for him <laughs> because he has not said anything on land. He says, I support land restitution and redistribution. But the moderators don't ask him a simple question. Since you support land reinstitution and redistribution, who have you given land in Western Cape? Who? Who have you given land, Helen Zile? Who have you given land, Musi? Where we govern, you even change accent. We govern very well. <laughs> where? Where have you given people land? There is no democracy without land. At the core of our struggle, what started the ANC was as a result of land dispossession. The, the wars which were fought by African people against the British and colonizers, and they got defeated. They then realized that fighting as small tribes is self-defeating. We need to come together so that we fight for our land. So the starting of liberation struggle in South Africa was not necessarily about the issue of who becomes a president. The issue has always been the land. Mandela went to prison for land. Subukwe was killed for land. Steve Biko was killed for land. Chris Sani was killed for land. They were not killed because they wanted to become politicians in air-conditioned offices. The land question is non-negotiable. Thank you.